All right, welcome to another episode of Catholic Mindset, where we create Catholic content for Catholics. Today we have Emily Ritchie, founder of Gloria Marketing, a Catholic marketing agency that helps you not hate marketing so that you can market like Jesus. How are you, Emily? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing good. I like your intro message, your, your slogan, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Would you mind leading us in prayer? No, I'd love to. Thank you so much. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, thank you for the gift of this day, for the gift of being able to gather together and uh, just come to know you better through all the wonderful gifts that you've given us, that we can glorify you and bring more people to you. I ask that you bless our conversation, um, and please bless all of those who are listening to this conversation now and in the future. Please help them to know of your love and of the unique and beautiful mission that you've given them to go out into the world and make disciples in whatever way you've called them uniquely to do. We ask all of this through the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, the woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you for that. So we like to start here with an opening question. What does your heart desire the most? Oh. So I will start by saying my love language, I like to say, is sarcasm. Um, so my sarcastic answer as a mom of two under three would have to be sleep, that my heart <laughs> desires sleep the most. Uh, but truly, what my heart desires the most uh, is to get to heaven and bring as many people with me as possible. Amen. Amen. So Gloria Marketing, it was funny. I was doing some research on, on YouTube on how to, um, yeah, how to market my, my Catholic show. Or I was specifically looking for how to create a Google ad mm. for Catholic um, material, like, like my stuff. Yeah, so I've been playing around with some like, keywords and whatever. And then, it, and then I Googled it and you came up with a little lesson, a little lesson on how to do that, like a little walkthrough. And that's when I reached out and I say, hey, Emily, let's do a show. And then you were super awesome. You, you responded right away. So um, so tell us, how did it all start? What was the inspiration behind Gloria Marketing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I started out by working in a parish. Uh, my first job at the ripe old age of 14 was working at my parish uh, at the front desk, you know, answering the phones, taking the mass intentions, all of that. Um, and I ended up working there for almost a decade uh, in as I like to say with church work, you wear a lot of hats. Uh, and I have done basically everything in church work except be a priest and say mass. Uh, so, you know, youth ministry, faith formation, uh, event planning, the ministry coordinator, baptism coordinator, like literally all the things. Um, and when I was finally leaving that position, when I was getting married and moving away. Uh, I, I realized that, you know, we have such a great product as a church in terms of eternal salvation we do a terrible job of marketing it. Uh, you know, I have a, a marketing background and just being able to look at that, you know, through my college experience and all of that of just, you know, Jesus told us to go out and make disciples and he didn't make that optional, but we kind of treat it like it's optional uh, in, in our faith, right? And so being able to, you know, combine some of these marketing and uh, communication strategies with evangelization. And really when we look at it, we find out that Jesus actually did marketing before marketing was cool, right? Like evangelization is just Catholic marketing. Uh, and so I have a master's degree in theology. And uh, as a Bible studies nerd, I love going through the Bible and just picking out different points in the Gospels and, you know, the Acts of the Apostles. Like, oh, that's a marketing strategy. Oh, hey, they were doing marketing there. Um, you know, and just really being able to see all of those things come together so that we can grow the church today, right? They did a really great job in the beginning of growing the church from like 12 people, 11, if you, you know, you don't count Judas, right? Uh, from 11 people in the beginning to, you know, 3,000 people baptized in one day to now millions and millions and millions of Catholics later. And we can still use those same strategies to grow our businesses and ministries today. So it started from just kind of the practical church work experience and then, you know, just slowly evolved into this entity of itself of being able to help other people to do that. And it's been really fun. So who, who was that first client that got you started? 
Yeah, that's a very interesting story. Uh, so in the beginning, you know, if you've ever done any sort of work in like the business world and starting up a, a small business podcast, selling a book, anything that you're trying to do, right? Um, those first couple of weeks and months are really tough where you just have that imposter syndrome of, is anybody going to like me? Am I actually doing the right thing, right? Um, and I had been at this for a little bit. I was working a full-time job. I had just gotten married. I was in grad school and I was like, God, I just, I can't do this. Like, you know, this is just going to be way too overwhelming. Um, and I went to adoration and I was like, I'm, I'm going to be done. Right. And I came home to my very new husband. I think we'd been married like two or three months at that point. And wise beyond our two months of marriage, he said to me, well, why don't you just give up one more day? Like, what's one more day going to do? Like, okay, whatever. And the very next day I got my very first client. Uh, and so God was kind of speaking through him of just kind of take that patience of the next day. Uh, so my first client was a Catholic author uh, named Kimberly Cook. She has a bunch of books out now. Um, I had worked with her, I think on her second book, um, doing some PR and social media kind of work for her. Awesome. And it, it, was that her first book? I think it was her second book. Okay. If I remember correctly. Yeah. she. I think she had self-published both of them. And I think we were working on her second one. We've done a bunch together now, so I can't remember which one it was in particular. But that's super cool. And the publishers are, are very interesting. I have a couple of friends who are publishers too. And they, they are focused in their book, right? And in the content that they've written. So I guess you come in and you grab that marketing expertise and grab that content and then make it, get it out there. Exactly. Yeah. Who can work with you? What kind of clients are you taking on? Are you, are you, you have a white range or are you, are you like niching down in a particular sector? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I like to say that anybody who's trying to reach Catholics or trying to evangelize, right? The, those two groups. Um, but that typically comes down to, I work with a lot of churches, a lot of Catholic small businesses, um, Etsy shop owners, authors, service providers, a lot of Catholic coaches. Um, but yeah, anybody who's trying to reach Catholics and struggling to do that or trying to reach uh, non-Catholics, but in an evangelistic sense. Um, can you, well, I didn't know they were Catholic coaches. Yeah. Yeah. Like, of... e, like PE coaches or like, like, uh, spiritual advisors or what? Yeah. A lot, a lot of Catholic life coaches, um, Catholic health coaches, um, this Catholic relationship coaches, business coaches, um, that specifically work in a, a Catholic sense of trying to, you know, help Catholics through spiritual problems or business problems or health problems. Awesome. Yeah. So. What are the range of services that Gloria Marketing offers? Yeah, so our main kind of thing, we I love doing uh, consulting. So hopping on calls with people. I just love talking through marketing problems and being able to, again, just kind of align that back to how Jesus would market. And, you know, that really just ends up illuminating people's minds of like, oh, marketing isn't this scary thing that I have to hate if Jesus did it too. So I love, you know, just hopping on consulting and strategy calls. We also do practical work too, like website design, email marketing, um, copywriting, all those fun types of things. Consulting, perfect. And I, and I even, even for me, I think that I've, I did my master's in business and I've gone through courses and marketing and try to stay up to date in the communication space. And, and especially on the podcasting, I'm always learning. It is always good to have people to bounce ideas from or, or receive guidance from, because it's, it's a lot. It's a lot if I just want to focus on my craft, having somebody else to help with that is important for, for small marketing companies. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, Jesus sent us out two by two for a reason, right? And a lot of us in this space are doing this as a solopreneur. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Being able to have somebody else who can come, kind of come alongside you and be like, hey, this is, you know, a really great thing. And here's how we can get this in front of people. And, you know, I, I always say, you know, being able to know what you do, but even more importantly, why you do it. People are always, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Simon Sinek, but his idea is that you start with the why, right? You start with why you're doing something instead of the what. And we tend to go out in front with what we're doing instead of why. And if we can just flip to that why, it becomes so much easier to know who we're talking to and where they are. So we have, we have consulting. What other things are you dabbling in? Uh, yes, yeah, so we do uh, website design, email marketing, um, some copywriting, um, you know, for blogs or things like that. A um, little bit of advertising, some SEO, kind of across the board. I try to be full service. And if I don't know how to do it, I know somebody who does. Awesome. Emailing is also very strong. I, I like emails because it allows you to have ownership of your 
of your um, community mm -hmm. because you never know what can happen, right? Let's say, yeah. I, I mean, I was talking to my friend from the, the Catholic couple that, that I interviewed one of my first sh shows that I started reaching out to people like you. They responded and he blew up. He did it. He did a reel. He blew up and then Instagram blocked his account for a month. No, <laughs> no growth. And he didn't understand why. So uh, that's why I like collecting people's emails or trying to find ways to collect emails because if something like that happens mm -hmm. you you can um you can reach out to your to your fan or to your customer or your follower directly exactly and i think yeah no emailing is 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 important um, at least in, in my eyes but absolutely so uh i guess let me ask you regarding the the, the issue that brought me to you the, the reason i came across your video is because i was having trouble targeting catholics i I don't know why I was not able to, I, I am not able to target Catholics on Google ads. When I put Catholics, it doesn't show. I even tried the techniques on the video that you made a long time ago. I'm putting Scott Hands or popular Catholic names. I couldn't do it. I don't know why I cannot target Catholic. I feel like we're being, <laughs> like we're being targeted, um, but it, 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 it's hard to market my show or to select my market on the social media. So I don't, I don't know what you, what you think about that. Yeah. So about a year or two ago, um, Facebook in particular, now Meta, removed all religious targeting from their platforms for advertising. Um, they also removed other things as well. So sexual orientation, political affiliation, things like that. And I, I honestly don't necessarily think it was nefarious on their part. I think that because um, they're losing money from it, right? Because now all of us who were doing these techniques and advertising are realizing that it was not as successful anymore. The reason that they were doing that was because people are actually using that to uh, target people to send hate ads to them. Um, and so they were actually advised by religious leaders and by political affiliation um, leaders to remove those targeting parameters. And they were kind of pressured to be able to do that. Um, so that does make it pretty difficult, um, even within the paid advertising space, to reach the people that we're trying to reach. Uh, what I will say is from a social media perspective, particularly from Meta, um, you can do what's called a lookalike audience. So essentially you take an audience that um, you already have and you say to Facebook or Instagram or whatever, like, hey, I have these people already. Find more people like them. The problem with that is that we don't necessarily know how they look like. So that might be that they are the same age or they went to the same college or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it does take a little bit more time and patience to be able to test that out. But I have seen some good results for clients to be able to do that sort of thing. Um, there are some platforms that have not completely removed religious targeting. Um, I know LinkedIn is one where you can still target based on Catholic colleges, um, Catholic groups that people are in or th and things like that. Um, but it does make it a little bit more difficult, even from a paid side, to reach the audience you're trying to reach. Uh, the other avenue that I like to look at as well, there's an organization called Catholic AdNet. Um, and so they will only show your advertisements on Catholic or clean or Christian sites. You get to pick which kind of site you want to be able to show your ads on. And so that's a good alternative to be able to display some display and banner kind of ads on only Catholic sites. Okay, got it. It makes sense. I mean, and I didn't really think about the negative effects of, I don't, I don't even know why would people pay to send I know. Catholics bad ads. I mean, because in my mind, it didn't even come across. Oh, right. Why, why would I pay my own money to send hate ads? I, I yeah. get it. I get it on social media. We get we all, we all get hate, you know, but to to actually pay to 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 hate on cat on, on Catholics or religious groups. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have some pretty deep hate in your heart to to pay for that. Yeah. You got definitely got to pray for those people. Okay, no, hundred um, percent. Okay, cool. So look at like ads. Yes, you're, you're right. It makes sense. But I have I ever heard about Catholic ad net. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're a really great group. I've worked with them for years. We'll check them out. We'll check them out. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about creators like myself, and they're just like I'm meeting so many awesome people doing great work. As I reach out to them to jump on the show, and 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 obviously there's people that have been doing this for a long time. Uh, what would you say to small creators to get them motivated to keep going? Yeah, it, it's really tough because we're in a place in our society where there's so much content creation, right? Like there's, it seems like everybody and their brother is like an influencer or a podcaster or a blogger or something, right? And so it's really easy for us when we're in this space and we're kind of in this small growth phase of 
does my voice matter, right? And I like to think back, you know, to, to bring in the biblical example, right, of the, the story of the 99 sheep, but Jesus going after that one sheep, right? And a lot of times I'll, I'll end my consulting calls with clients with asking them, would you do this for one person? Like if you knew going in that Jesus had only called you to talk to one person, that there was one person whose soul you were going to get to heaven because of the work that you're doing, would you still do it? And so far, every single person has said yes, right? That they feel so deeply and so strongly about this call that they would continue to do it. I say, okay, talk to that one person. Because a lot of times in marketing, we tend to look at all the sheep. We look at all hundred of the sheep. And we're like, I have to talk to all of these people and everything that I do has to be relevant to every single person, right? And we forget that in both evangelization and marketing, one-on-one is the key, right? If we can talk to people and make them feel seen and known as an individual, not only are we going to be able to evangelize so much better, that's how Jesus did it, right? But we're also going to be able to market so much better because people buy not because, or people donate or whatever it is that you're wanting them to do, whatever action you want them to take. They're not necessarily taking that action because you were so broad and so generic. They're probably actually taking that action because they heard something that you said or they read something that you wrote and they said, oh my goodness, they know me. That's me. They're talking to me. They get it, right? And that's the feeling we want to elicit. So don't focus on all the big voices and all the people that you're trying to talk to. Find the one person that you've been called to serve and talk to that person and you'll inevitably end up reaching a whole lot more people because a lot of people end up feeling the same way. I like that. I like that. And you're right. It does feel sometimes like, oh man, with all these people. But I like the the focus on on the one. I like that. And what about what about all those Catholics that may may want to start something or or evangelize on the social media as they don't know how or or maybe they're scared, concerned, or worried sure. about the hate comments or what would you say to the to to the people that are like maybe this close to mm-hmm. to starting something? What I would say, um, it, it's going to kind of come across a little bit as tough love, <laughs> is it, Jesus didn't make the Great Commission optional, right? He didn't say, go and make disciples as long as you don't have to show your face online, right? Or go and make disciples as long as it makes you feel comfy. Or go and make disciples as long as you don't have to dance in a reel, right? Right? Like all of these things that we look at and we feel really uncomfortable and awkward and all of that. We're kind of supposed to. He kind of told us we were going to. Um, And so I think being able to just have that courage of Jesus told me to do this. This is the mission that he's placed on my heart. And I'm in the time and the place that I am because he knows that I am able to use these tools to get this message to as many people as possible. Right. So as much as we focus on that one person, we do know that the beauty of digital marketing is that we're able to reach so many more people than if we were just writing with a quill, right? Over the quill pen, you know, back hundreds of years ago, right? We have the ability to tell so many people who need it that Jesus loves them so much. And he's put that on our heart. We're supposed to go to all the nations and all the nations today might mean opening the Instagram app on your phone. So in the Catholic marketing space that you're in, what's your favorite part about all this world? Mm. Well, I think it, two parts. I love being able to be a small part of the missions that all of these incredible people are doing to put so much love and beauty from God into the world. Like that that's just so fun to just be able to be a small part of that. But I really nerdily love just opening a marketing book or opening a bi- opening the Bible and just seeing the connections there between how Jesus markets and how we are called to evangelize today. Like they're just so similar. There's um, it, anybody who has ever, ever heard me speak will know that I talk about the rule of seven a lot. So the rule of seven in marketing is that you, on average, somebody needs to see something about seven times before they'll take an action, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why you get a ton of retargeting ads, right? If you go on, you know, Zappos, right? And you suddenly, the pair of shoes is following you all over the internet, right? That's because you didn't take the action that they wanted. And so now they're following you all around because they know you need a bunch of reminders, Right. Well, in the Bible, when we look at numbers in the Bible, numbers have both spiritual and numerical significance, right? So we know that three is the number of the Trinity, right? We're supposed to be thinking of the Trinity when we see the number three in the Bible. 
The number seven is the number of the covenant. And it's not only the number of the covenant, the actual biblical word means covenant. So seven and covenant are the same word. And so we see that our relationship and how we're built into relationship with God is now reflected psychologically in how many times we need reminders to take an action to do something, right? And so we see all of these connections in the Bible of how Jesus is reaching out to a target audience and knowing who he's called to serve right? And he is like very focused on that one person or the gospel writers really focused on their audience of who they're called to serve, right? And not worrying about what other people are going to read and think about it, right? We see so many examples of this in the Bible and being able to disillusion people that marketing does not have to be something that you hate. And it can actually be just as holy as the work that God has placed onto your heart within your mission, um, and so I just really love being able to tell people about that and kind of seeing those light bulb moments happen. I like it. It's like, I used to have a magazine too, and I would tell people, hey, it takes seven times. I mean, and it, which is kind of weird to say that because I'm telling you, you need to pay for seven ads in my magazine <laughs> yeah. in order for you to get, you know, what you want. Yeah. But, uh, but I like, I like that. My math, my magazine at the time wasn't Catholic, it was a life, qual- a lifestyle magazine back in the day. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah. Yeah, that I remember. I remember that. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I also I was before jumping on the show. I was on your website and I see that you offer a course, mm-hmm. a free a free course, right? Yeah. I'm saying. Yep. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that course. What can we find in it? Yeah, yeah. So it's basically the the crash course in Catholic marketing, talking about a lot of the things that we've talked about here today. But um, you know, really kind of the the four things that you really need to have in place before you really try to start doing advertising or trying to do email, um, you know, really, again, honing in on why you do what you do, who you're doing that for, and then why they would care, right? And being able to answer those three questions to be able to really market effectively um, within a Catholic space or any space, really. Awesome. And it's easily accessible on the, on the website. I can also put the, the link on the show notes so people can, can have access to the course. Yeah. Um, I, there's many social media platforms out there. You know, I what do, what are you recommending your clients to focus on nowadays? Yeah, so it really depends on who you're trying to reach, right? And the kinds of content you have, right? So a lot of people tell me, oh, well, I don't really have a lot of photos, or I don't like being on video. Then YouTube is not the place for you, right? Or even Instagram might not be the place for you, right? So thinking about the kinds of content you're okay with creating or that you already have created. Um, But then the other side is who you're trying to reach, right? So if you're trying to reach, um, you know, a male audience, right? I'm not going to tell you to go on Pinterest, right? That's probably not where most of the men are going to be, right? Uh, So you're really thinking about the age, the gender, all of that sort of thing. But then it's a lot about where are you going to get the most for the content that you're creating? So I personally like Instagram because there's a lot of different things you can do with it. Um, So you can do reels, right? You can do stories. There's a lot of different things you can do within the platform all within one. Um, They just came out with the new Threads app, which I love because I'm an English major. So like just the writing and just words, beautiful. That's my thing, Um, right? But, you know, really being able to utilize a lot of that platform. But then I also love something like YouTube or Pinterest or something like that because it's search-based, which means it has so much more longevity. So the content you're creating there you might not get a ton of views on it the next day, but you could still be getting views on that days, weeks, literally years later, drawing people back to your site. Whereas I think you would probably maybe see an Instagram post for a couple of hours before it goes away, right? So being able to kind of balance that, I the you know the dopamine hit of, ooh, I got a lot, a lot of likes in the beginning with, yeah, but we can also see something that has more longevity and more ability to bring people to you longer. So I typically recommend some sort of combination of those of having a longevity uh, content pillar and then something that's a little bit more um, social, if you will, uh, to be able to distribute that content. So something like Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. I like that. I like the longevity part because that's how I that's how I found you on one of your long pieces, <laughs> one of your long form format content. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know when I honestly don't remember how long ago you made that video it, it was a while ago <laughs> it was but he was and i searched you up but i searched the, the topic and then you were there yeah awesome awesome well emily this has been 
very educational. I've definitely learned a lot. So this is the win, 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 I guess, for you, me and the listener, I hope. Um, and we, we normally like to end with a, with a question here uh, about what is your favorite part about your faith? Oh, there's so many things. Ah. I mean, obviously, just like all the beautiful aspects. Again, I, as I've said, I love reading the Bible, you know, being able to dive into that. But I mean, you can't beat the Eucharist, right? Like mm -hmm. the Eucharist is just the most beautiful and incomprehensible mystery that we have. And I, I've joked before, you know, I love going to, going to Eucharistic adoration and trying to describe like what's pulling me there. Like I've never stood in the grocery store aisle and just not been able to leave the bread aisle, right? Like there's something different about the Eucharist that just draws you in. And even if you can't explain it, you know he's there and you know he loves you. Uh, or at least I do. And I, I, that's why I love the Eucharist, love the Eucharistic adoration. Awesome. Emily, thank you so much again for jumping on the show. You're doing great work helping Catholics out there evangelize. I've definitely learned. So I look forward to to trying some of these. I like the lookalike audience. I'm going to focus on that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. And thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun.